Hey, I'm Frances Katzen and welcome to my podcast, The World of Real Estate. In this series, we will explore the world's largest asset class and how it plays out on a global scale. So I'm thrilled to have a dear friend of mine on the show today who is a legend in his own right. He has navigated the recession real estate scene through hard work, determination, and a pure authenticity to develop one of San Diego's elite real estate teams. His rise in the ranks of Douglas Elliman in management, etc., and now has found his calling in coaching for growth and leadership. The very humble Dave Worth, I am elated to have you join today. You have a unique inspiring story that has served me and others as one of the more powerful reminder of the heights you can reach through grit, dedication. Welcome. Thanks. I need to cruise around with you and have you be my hype person. That was a great intro. Good job. (laughs) I learned from the best, Dave, you. (laughs) Oh, I wouldn't have done that. I would have tangent and rabbit holed and it would be like a 15 minute intro. So you did great. (laughs) Thank you for that. You're very welcome. It's it's really meant from truth. So let's dive in. Where did you grow up, Dave? I grew up in a podunk, weird little town in Alberta, Canada. So if you've <laughs> Alberta? ever been to... Oh my yeah. God, it's so cold there. Oh. oh, man, it's crazy cold. Like your nostrils <laughs> will freeze together in the winter <laughs> if you don't have a scarf on. So yeah. Yeah, so I grew up in a little town called Carstairs, which if you're familiar with Alberta, it's kind of somewhere between Calgary and Banff. Um, And so I moved like every three years. So I kind of bebopped around between there and Calgary and Victoria, British Columbia. And so I was, I was kind of like a military brat kid Uh, that I followed my parents' jobs. So Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but you know, Canada is a beautiful place. It's a great place to grow up bloody cold that's all I'm gonna say yeah Um, where are your parents from then so my dad was born in Banff and uh, my mom was actually from the east coast so she was closer to Toronto so um, but they met in Alberta and you know who knows who knows how it all came together but it did okay and what were their professions Dave so growing up um, you know previous to previous to me uh, my dad had been a cop he had been a gas truck driver. He'd been some pretty blue collar jobs. Um, and growing up, my dad was a private jet pilot. So he flew private jets, um, executives. And then um, that eventually morphed into uh, doing like cargo, like uh, urgent cargo. So things like people when they have like heart transplant, you know, my dad wow. would get a call all night and have to go because somebody in Ohio had passed away and they had to move that, you know, heart from. Ohio to like Texas. So it was pretty wild job. Um, my mom's was a little more, uh, vanilla in that, um, she started as like a executive assistant at a big utility company in Canada. And so she ended up rising to the ranks of the C-suite. So she ended up in her career at, Hmm. you know, pretty young age. I mean, she retired at like 58 or something. Mom. Yeah. So she's a, she's a beast. Total. How would you describe yourself? That's such a tough question. I know. That's why I ask <laughs> what, it. What, I know. It is a tough <laughs> question. Um, I think I'm really intuitive. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a pretty passionate person, mm-hmm. uh, for sure. Like when I get locked in on things, I'm I'm mm-hmm. locked in. Mm-hmm. I um, I'm I'm rebellious when I'm when I'm creating or, or driving on a vision. Um, but I'm I'm kind of like a rule follower too, you know. Especially when other people are around. Like I was, you know, thinking about this. Like, have you ever been to like a concert? or like a sporting event mm-hmm. and friends kind of turn into total jerks and they're just like <laughs> are disturbing other people it's like the wild part of me wants to like get right in there but then i'm like there's a family with kids you guys <laughs> calm it down so <laughs> so it's like i'm a rebel until you put me in a situation where it impacts other people and then i'm like i fall in line so um so there's that i'm impatient you know i'm impatient mm. I wouldn't know anything projects. about that, would I? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, you, well, I mean, I think in order to be a really driven person, you have to be impatient, you know? Um, mm. But then like when it comes to people, I'm extremely patient. So, and I think that that comes through in coaching. Um, I'm very much a ride or die with my relationships. I mean, you're either in my camp or you're not. And um, 
you know, I'm a Scorpio. So it's like, you cross me and it's, it's not good. <laughs> I take it really, take it hard. So, um, you know, I don't know. I'm going to have to go back and listen to the self-description and be like, man, that guy sounds like a jerk. Not at all. But you said something interesting. You said um, about you're, you're very impatient with your own goals. And I cut yeah. you off accidentally, so I apologize. Would you finish that uh -huh. statement? Um, I'm just impatient in I've, – I've learned to be patient. Actually, you know, being in the corporate side of things, you know, I've always kind of been more entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. And in the corporate world, you know, things move at a certain pace. When you're an entrepreneur, you can kind of drive things forward. But in both regards, you know, waiting for the results to show up, I'm impatient. Yeah, I'm the same. And and I've had to learn to be patient because you kind of drive yourself nuts because there's just some things you don't have control over. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, I've I've had to learn it. It's you know, my annual reviews in the corporate world. That's like the thing that you know when you're a kid and it's like David talks too much and if he book, <laughs> like that was me in in school in the corporate world. It's Dave needs to slow down and chill out basically and like be a little more patient because you know. In a big corporation, things move slower than what Dave wants it to be. So that's why you hired me, guys, because I get I know. It done. I know, I know. So work in progress. <laughs> so pathetic that kind of feedback. I'm sorry, it just doesn't do anything. No, there, I, you know, there's good stuff, but it's like that's the part. It's like you know the improvement section, like section you know two D. Yeah. It's like can the employee get better? <laughs> uh, you know, mine's like chill out, like <laughs> stop, be more patient. There's so many places I want to go right now in this, but I'm going to start with basic stuff. So how did you land up in San Diego coming from a Canada boy? That's cool. Uh, yeah. Um, so when I didn't have any intention of going to college, I was, when I was in high school, I was, yeah, I grew up in a pretty strict household. Um, did you? And, and, you know, I was the quintessential teen, like hit 14, 15, and then the wheels came off, you know, like <laughs> too much structure, too strict for too long, uh, turns your kids wild. Yeah. And so, you know, I got super into the punk rock scene and I got super into, um, you know, the world of skateboarding and snowboarding and extreme sports and partying and like, you know, that like, you know, girls, like that was my, that was my focus from mm -hmm. 15 to say, well, 17, 18. I think I graduated when I was 17 because I was a year ahead, but um you know i just wasn't into academ academia mm -hmm. at all mm -hmm. and coming out of out of high school i told my parents i'm like i'm gonna be a pro snowboarder you guys watch and i wasn't anywhere close to being a pro snowboarder i like thinking back i'm like it was not even one one hundredth of a way <laughs> being a <laughs> pro snowboarder but in my head like i was pretty good and so yeah i took that year off and i had some really crappy jobs I mean, I was like doing drywall mud and I don't know if you've ever been the guy or well, you've never been the guy, but if you've ever it. been around the drywall site, mm -hmm. it's like these giant pails of drywall mud. These things have to weigh, I don't even know, 80, 100 pounds and you have to carry two at a time. <laughs> and you have to kind of do these balancing acts across trenches in the construction site. Oh my God. And I made it like five days and I thought my arms were gonna tear out of their sockets and I came home. And this was like, cause my parents kind of came in like, they're like, Hey, you can live at home, but you gotta have a job. And, and you know, this was a job that was early in the morning and then I could get off and I could go party in the afternoon kind of thing. That was mm -hmm. the goal. Um, and it was flexible enough that when the snow was good, I could go snowboarding. And so I got home, you know, after a couple of days on this job and my mom looked at me and she, I could tell she's like, you're pathetic. <laughs> and, and she's right. Like I was <laughs> totally beat up. And she just said to me, she goes, Hey, She's like, if you're ready to kind of make the choice to go back to school, pick somewhere to go and I'll help you out with the first year. So in my mind, I was like, all right, I'm like, I need to go, you know, self-explore. So I actually jumped in my car with my buddy. We packed up all my stuff and this was like probably end of June and we just started driving and we were following bands down, down the West coast into the U because I knew I'm like, if I'm going to go to school, I'm not going to stay in Canada. It's cold. Like I'm going to go somewhere nice. You know, mom's mom's kind of given me the the license to to go for it, and so we started driving. We spent like a month and a half driving down the west coast of the U.S. through Washington, Oregon, Canada, following bands, going to shows, um, and and as I was going, you know, we'd kind of stop in certain towns, and I would check it check out the town. And I'd spent a lot of time in San Diego growing up, coming here on spring break, and so 
I kind of couldn't go any further south. I mean, that's the truth. Like I might have kept going, um, but I got here and and then I ran into the challenge that like my grades were terrible. <laughs> Yeah, I was like a D student, no oh, doubt. Man. Um, but the nice part about being an out of state and or an international student was schools like money and they'll charge you for it. And so I found this little community college and they said, OK, we'll take you. And so I got in with like a D average and um, and then it just kind of went from there. And like the first thing I did was start a punk band. I mean, that was like, I wasn't here to go to school. I told my mom I was, but I was like, oh, the punk scene's big in, in Southern California. I'm going to go there, do that. And uh, yeah, so I started and how did punk it go? Band. And I mean, it, you know, it was kind of like my snowboarding career. It was like, <laughs> you know, it seemed I seemed like a really good idea. Seemed like a great, I mean, it was so much fun, I'm Fran. Sure. I mean, that was like Dude. the glory days to totally. the max. But in terms of like, the, you know, look where I am now and look where I was then. I mean, we're But I'm so impressed that you did that. You gave yourself that time. I think sometimes we don't. And I think there's so much fear about taking the time to do that. Yeah. And, you know, there's this, you know, it's funny because I have, you know, with my kids, my wife was very academic. You know, she went, you know, went to the big school. She's a mm -hmm. very, very intelligent person. Um, and she really has a firm, uh, she's like a really firm belief that, that, you know, it's very important to go to college and university. And, and I don't disagree with her, but I don't have that same lens because I was such a daydreamer. You know, I like I would be in class and I'd be looking out the window, like visualizing myself in all these different roles in life um, and had no no passion for grades, no passion to be the top of my class. Like none of that. I was I my head was in a different spot and I look at my kids and I'm like, they're kind of the same way. And, it, you know. <laughs> My wife and I'm like I'm like listen I'm like if Zoe goes and like to Switzerland to like DJ school and she becomes a world class DJ like I'm in because <laughs> I know DJs in Vegas they're making one hundred seventy five thousand dollars an hour spinning records like I'm good with that so you know it's just it's funny like it's funny. I just I, I, I'm I'm with you I didn't get to go to college and I had no desire to either so I, I don't know that you have to do it all one way and i think it takes a lot of courage to 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 be the daydreamer and go and trust the intuition side of it that's not to yeah. say it's right or wrong it's just different yeah and i just you know i think like i think the way we have it set up as a society like i know that this is more true in places you know other places in the world other than the us like take a couple years off and go totally. freak out and then go totally. to school that's exactly right i agree with yeah. that in australia yeah. they do one year of deferred just go and travel because you don't know who yeah. you are after that but um, yeah well my one year was drywall and crappy job so <laughs> i think it said somebody said hey here's a ticket go somewhere cool i think might have might have been a better fit for me but you know it is what it is what were your hopes and ambitions growing up i mean i think you kind of touched on that and answered that so i know it's a bit redundant but did you have anything besides the snowboarding yeah i mean like like i, said, I was a daydreamer like yeah. i was i was so visual mm -hmm. i would just sit there and put myself in in scenarios and i think i think about this and it's like i remember top gun the movie coming out and like i don't know like 1986 19 somewhere maybe 88 something like that so mm -hmm. i was pretty young mm -hmm. and like I, in my head, I'm like fighter pilot. I'm like, that's what I'm doing. Cause my dad was a pilot, right? right. So I was in, I was in jets a lot. We, you know, I'd always ride in the jump seat with them. And um, so, you know, I was, as a kid, I was like everything. I was, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to be a pro snowboarder. I wanted to be a singer in a band. I wanted to, you know, I want to ha have businesses. Like I, so my hopes were what I would consider very lofty um, and very visual. Like it was like I yeah I was I was something different every day. I love that though. I think that's so important. Now, can I ask? There was one job that I wanted to have the viewers hear about because I just thought this was so brilliant in terms of what you did with it and how it shaped your next portion of your life. You were in the customer service in like a rental car company, right? Yeah, enterprise rent a car. So talk to oh, me about man. that. A green machine. That's what we called it. <laughs> green machine <laughs> tell me about um, that it was such a terrible job and <laughs> such a like you know foundational amazing job at the same time there's if you've seen the movie Step Brothers with Will Ferrell yes 
I'm okay. Wolf, has that line in there where he talks about he's you know he's like <laughs> down on his last straw and he's like I'm gonna go to Enterprise. He's now and you know they have the tools to help you succeed in a great training program like that. That was how I ended up in that job because so you went from a rock band to to the rental car. Yeah, I mean I had a new baby at home. I mean literally like a two month old and I was I just sold a business that I'd started in college which was really not very successful at all. Um, it was like an indoor media advertising, but the reality is, it's like we were going to the office and like drinking at like one in the afternoon and it was like me and my buddies and no work ethic. We, you know, it was ridiculous. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then suddenly I'm like married and got a kid and I'm like, wow, I gotta go get a job. And so I looked at my most responsible friends and at the time I was 26. Jeez. So like my friends were still partying pretty hard and doing that. And I'm like, okay, what are my responsible friends doing? And they're like, a lot of them were working at enterprise. I'm like, okay. And so I got, you know, I got roped into the pitch of, you know, you can be an area manager and make, you know, $90,000. And I'm like, 90,000. Oh my God. It's amazing. So, um, I'm sorry, I'm not being to laugh no, me. it's, I know it's ridiculous. I mean, it's like, but I, like I said, it's foundational. I mean, I learned how to sell there because you got to think yeah. about what you're selling. You're selling people insurance. That's really all it is. So you're like, it's like, oh, are you sure you want to take the car? Because, you know, if you put a scratch on it, we're going to get you for it. And, like, that's the pitch. But um, I actually had a manager there, this guy, John Gobbin, that he was a really cool dude. And and he taught me a lot of stuff about sales. And I was, by the way, friend, I was only there for five months. <laughs> I, and, like, this wasn't a career. Like, this was this. <laughs> If it gives you a lens into like yeah. that impatience part at five minutes, I'm like, what? why am I not the manager? What the hell's going on? I'm like, I'm your number one sales. Like, where's the promotion? And then I realized the promotion was probably two years off and I'd already burned through like four pairs of shoes and <laughs> was sick of my tie getting sucked up into the vacuum cleaner every time I was like cleaning these god cars out. And so, you know, it was like, but, but Don was, he was good, man. Like he taught me, he taught me the, Tommy ropes of sales for sure. But yeah, it was a really shitty job. Wow. So you had a wife, a baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were so now we go into the the segue here of uh, a little bit about door knocking. In the midst of two thousand and eight economic recession, yeah. you started your real estate career by going door to door and nobody does this. I mean, just as a viewer listening in real estate is typically canvas not literally knocking on doors but no not with Dave Dave was door to door in San Diego why did you decide to enter this industry at the time and what was going on for you okay so there's a little there's a little story ahead of this so after my rise to success at enterprise i went and worked for another company because i had another buddy who happened to be making a little bit more money he wasn't responsible but he was making i think he was making like forty two thousand a year and i was like wow that's a lot of money <laughs> so i went to this company called bridgepoint education mm -hmm. and bridgepoint was basically an online university and i was a um what's the name it was like like student advisor mm -hmm. the reality of what it was is i sat in a cubicle trying to cold call leads to get these people to sign up for these, you know, government backed loans oh, um, for this very expensive education that really they had no hope in hell of ever completing. And then they were going to owe the government and Bridgepoint education a bunch of money. And I think they're since out of business, but I wonder why. hopefully they are because yeah. if somebody listens to it, it might be getting a call. Predatorial. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, super predatorial. I mean, I don't know how deep we can go, but I'll tell you, <laughs> this was the, so I was in this cubicle and it was a full call center environment. And I, I call this phone number in, I, I think it was, you know, something parish, Louisiana. And I kept calling this phone number and, and this lady finally answers. And I was like, you know, Hey, is Sally or whatever her name was there? And she goes, Oh, honey, she doesn't get off the stage till about one thirty this <laughs> afternoon. And then she's gotta be right back at the club. And I'm like, what? And she goes, she's a dancer she's not going to school. Why do you keep calling here? And I was like, Oh my God, one, these leads suck. And like two, like, I would love for this dancer to get education. Like I do believe in that there's, but like, there's, what am I doing? And so I kind of had like a panic attack. Um, and I just bailed and that was like six weeks into it. And so I had to kind of go home and have this like moment with myself of, of, 
you know, like, what the hell are you doing? And so I'm on Craigslist looking for jobs and there's this, there's this ad and it's like, design your life, you know, like this really deep ad. And it was a real estate company, which I'll not name. Um, and it, it was a really brilliant ad. I mean, it was the perfect ad for me because here I am a daydreamer and I'm like selling, you know, education to strippers and <laughs> Debbie come down from the stage. And like, yeah. like the idea that I can design my life. So I went in and signed up. And so I got my license pretty quickly. Um, and then, you know, the part they didn't tell me was hey dude like there's your chair and in, in the bullpen like good luck you know there was no training so and and it happened that i'm starting at the time i i literally remember fran i remember walking in the door of the brokerage and two people were walking out crying the box <laughs> loaded up with stuff and like you know here i am kind of freshly off the punk scene freshly out oh, of rental car sales like no understanding of the economy i bought my house in 2007 at the height of the market nobody told me and my buddy denny was the one that sold me the house thanks denny thanks denny yeah thanks buddy for not giving me the heads up that i <laughs> bought it literally i literally bought it in may of 2007 which i think is the like high. when it, yeah so <laughs> on a negative amortization loan so my loan was growing every month like it wasn't shrinking it was growing i mean it was a mess and so here I am. I'm like, oh, that's new. Like, I'm going to design my life, like life by design. And people are crying and walking out of the brokerage with their box packed up. And so, you know, it took me probably about three months to queue in. It's like, oh man, this isn't good. Like things don't seem to be going well. Um, and so I kind of was like, well, like, how am I going to meet people? I'm like 26, 27 years old. I don't really know anyone. All my friends are like spending their money at the bars. They're not buying houses. And um, so I was just like, oh, I'm just going to start going to people's doors and knocking and see if they'll sell their house. And that's that's how that started. And and it was rough. I mean, San Diego's a hot. It. So I'm I'm suited up and I'm walking around in you know 95 degree weather in the middle of summer in a suit trying to sell uh, houses. And so that's that's kind of how it started. And who gave you your first break doing that? Uh, my first break came from a referral okay and i didn't even know about referrals no one told me about it you know i was doing open houses and knocking doors and trying cold calls and doing all these things and um a friend of mine i said hey i've got this coworker lives downtown san diego and uh they have a condo and he wants to sell it and so i went down there and the person's like oh so and so says you're great um you know, what do we need to do? And I was like, I don't even know what we need to do. I haven't even done a contract before, but I was like, oh yeah, I got to get the agreements in place. And you know, so I run back to the office and, and, and that's when- And how many it, months is this in to you? Oh, real estate? I didn't sell a house in my first year, friend. Like I was, Wow. I mean, so what yeah, I, I really sucked at the job early on because I just didn't have any guidance. You know, I just didn't know it was, I was grinding. I was like, whatever it takes. Jeez. So I think this was probably like month 10 or 11 Oof. that I finally got like a break. And, uh, and then, you know, and then it kind of went from there, but that was, that was a that pivotal be... moment of like this referral thing. I'm like, I gotta get people to do this more because this is way easier than going in the <laughs> doors, yeah. you know, like I can actually stay indoors in the summer in a suit. <laughs> and so, um, how long did it yeah, take you to sell it? It sold pretty quick. It was like 30 days. Cause it was this beautiful oh little condo downtown San Diego in a high rise. And you know, that was my first check and it was like. I don't know what it was. It was probably 7,000 bucks. But at the time, I mean, I was just came from $10 an hour at at Rent-A-Car Center. So 7,000 seemed like a big deal. Wow. So how did you get people to take you seriously after that, after these initial stages? What did you do to build it and to get your career going? Um, I don't know if they took me serious. I think I took myself (laughs) serious. Like, Uh I... I look at some old photos, I'll send them to you. Like I went to, I remember going to, I think right after that check, my wife was like, dude, we got to get you some better clothes. Like you don't <laughs> really. And so I remember going to men's warehouse. Do you remember? Yes. Is, is that, okay. George, George Zimmer or whatever. Yes. He's like, I'm not just the president. I'm the, you know, I don't know what it, the founder or whatever. We're going to make you look good. So I went and bought these three really crappy suits <laughs> um, and they were full dad suits. Like they had shoulder pads, <laughs> pants. Yeah. And like the fat weird tie and just like, and 
you know, at that point, I'm 27, 28. So I'm like pretty young, like thin dude. And, and swimming I'm in, in this, oh. yeah, I'm swimming in the suit. And that was me, like, take me seriously, you know? And, and so I would try to act serious. And, <laughs> and you know, it was like crazy when I think about it. Like, what are you doing? But yeah, I just, I didn't know. I didn't know any better. So just, so then, okay. I want to ask one more question off that it's not really part of, but how, so when did you shift to how long did it take for you to start getting comfortable and changing that into this process? Um, Pretty quickly, there were like, you know. Yeah, there were there were there were there were a couple pivotal moments. Um, one defining moment I remember is the one thing I was good at was working hard. Mm -hmm. Like that was one thing I was good at. I mean, my first probably three years, I legitimately worked seven days a week. Like not not like a like sort of seven, like a full seven. Um, and I remember getting to this point, I was at lunch with this insurance broker um, and another agent, and I almost passed out at the lunch. And fortunately, the hospital was right across the, the street. So I'm sitting there thinking I'm having a heart attack. I like can't swallow my food, full wow. panic attack, wow. but didn't know at the time I thought I was dying. And so I remember going in and laying in the ER and I'm sitting there just like so strung out and the doctor comes in and looks at me. He didn't even have to say anything. He goes, dude, go home, take a day off, go for a run, do some exercise and meditate. And, and like, and that just sent me like a full on like bawling crying. Cause I was just such a mess. And that was a moment defining moment for me of like, okay, I've been seeing it around me. I'm seeing people that I know in this business you know, have heart attacks, blow up their relationships. I'm like hearing and seeing all these things as I'm, you know, in these first couple of years of my business. And that was just like this kind of moment. I'm like, okay, I'm so like far removed from me as a person trying to be this like serious broker. Um, and so in a weird way, it made me more serious about the business and drive into the business more, but like from a standpoint of authenticity, not from mm -hmm. playing a playing a role, if right. that makes sense. A hundred percent. You know, so so I don't know if there was like a moment of like when other people took me serious, but when I decided to get serious about, hey, like authenticity is a big part of this. Um, you know, hitting your goals and working smarter is a big part of this. Like that that was that was a big <laughs> one for me. That is a big one because I think it changes the whole uh, trajectory because you're now authentic. You don't have to play. It's not exhausting in that way. Now yeah, and yeah, you know, and there was there was this moment where I realized I'm like I've you know living to work or working to live is a there big it is. definitive Talk definitive. Um, I was I was living to work. I was ignoring my wife. I was you know like not home. I had you know a little kid that was that was you know growing up quickly and um and it's, I just didn't want to be that way. I just was like, this is lame. This is like so, like, so misaligned for what creates happiness and for like the bigger picture. And, and, you know, I was forced to some degree to evaluate all this because I was young. I had mortgage payments. I had kids. I had all these things going on. And I realized this, this is not sustainable. And then I'm seeing example after example in the industry of people just blowing it. And, and I just didn't want to be that way. Wow. How do you find the right people to grow and achieve success with in this business? How did you do that for yourself? Um, I think gut a lot, like mm -hmm. intuition. You know, that's, that's, that's been a, that kind of the older I get or the more experienced I get with, with things, the more I realize like, People always say, oh, follow your gut. And it's like at a younger age, you're like, I don't know what the hell that means. You know, but but looking back, I realized how much was based on gut and intuition. So I think, you know, sitting with somebody and kind of being around their energy, um, you know, hearing what they have to say, that there's a lot be kind of between the words. Um, yep. pr proof of concept, you know, where, where else have they been successful and not necessarily... You know, I, I work with a lot of people in the coaching side to help them identify, you know, people for their teams, people, assistants. 
and they get very narrow focused. It's like, okay, if I'm going to hire an assistant, then this person's <laughs> been an assistant before for a real estate person. I'm like, yeah, but not really. Like there people can be successful and, and multi-dimensional. Um, and, and so, you know, I look at kind of where they've had success in their life and, and, you know, I'll, I'll talk to them like, Hey, tell me about your highs and lows. Let's go into high school. What were the highs and lows in high school? What about college? What about in your career? Like, I want to know where they've, they've persevered and, and driven forward. And I think that's kind of another piece of it is to look at it and go, um, I like to know they don't have a backup plan. You know, when I, when I work with people, like I don't, I want for them, I want, it's like, uh, you know, what is burn the boat, do right? The, Get on the, the boat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that's kind of how it was for me. Yep. Um, and I think when there is no backup plan, you get full attention and full focus from people and mm -hmm. full buy-in when there's a safety net, it's, it's hard. It it's is hard, hard to like, and it's not that they can't be successful or that they're not great people. It's just that my, when I'm looking to surround myself with people, I want to know there's no backup plan. That's such a great way to put it. It's such a great way to put it because I think just to sort of segue when people always say, how did you start when but I had no nothing to back me up. I had nothing but fear to drive me, right? So mm -hmm. I think when you have nothing to go back to and nothing to protect you, you just dig in and figure it out, which is basically your whole career here. Well, I out. remember sitting in these classes and, you know, they were trying to be inspirational. They're like, okay, everyone, <laughs> you know, write, write down your why. And I'm like, I need to make some fucking money. And then I, you know, that, that's what I'm sitting there. I'm like, that's the why. And then I'm looking around and I'm like, well, you know, I want to be able to like provide water to children in their continents. And I'm like, duh. I'm like, I want to pay my electric bill and like maybe get out of these shitty suits that I'm wearing. And these like amortized that. mortgages. Yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah. Like I want to get like a 30 year fixed instead of having my loan grow every month. Like that, that, that was my why. And so, you know, that, but there's no backup plan there. It was, it was, it was sink or swim. Can I ask a personal question? Of course. How did you arrive at choosing to be married in your 20s that young, knowing that you were a punk rocker, knowing that you were still sort of on this trajectory of trying to dream? Was it deliberate? Was it, I mean, how do you choose that amongst all of this nebulousness? Yeah. So I met my wife um, and for the you know i was I, so I'll, i remember i remember rolling into this bar okay uh, we're with a big group of friends we used to roll deep we'd roll 25 30 30 wow. of us and we would go into this karaoke bar in san diego and it was like kind of a you know the thing that we all did and i remember rolling in and there's this girl standing there in a camo mini skirt and like a banana yellow tube top and she's like super tan and it's got these like giant eyes and like beautiful hair and i'm sitting and i'm like who's that? And I'm like, okay, so I'm going to go fish. So, you know, I was literally like the minute I saw her, I was like, whoa. And then, um, I was kind of a jerk to her for probably a good four months. And then she, one night at another bar, she like called me out in front of everybody. She's like, I don't need people like you. Like I've got friends, you're an ass, you know, whatever. And, uh, and so then the next day I'm like, okay, I'm going to like date this girl and marry her. And so we, moved in together after dating for two months. She was pregnant after another two months. We were married at six months total and bought our first amazing investment, like, you know, 10 months in and then had a kid. So wow. I, we were so fast tracked that I wouldn't even call it a decision. It was pure like intuition. And so we've been married, uh, uh like 16 years. We've been married 16 years now. So, um, like kind of crazy, right? Like That's people insane. are like, oh, we dated, we did this. I'm like, no, I'm like, we literally just <laughs> tracked and moved in and did everything backwards and wrong. And, and but it, it was like, it was, it was, it was, again, it was that decision making, like her energy was amazing. You know, there was no game plan. Like there was the opposite of the game plan. So, um, yeah. So, you know, Thank and you it's, and, and I'm, and I'm sure I think about like my friends at 26. They're like, oh, look at this train wreck. What's Dave doing? Like, <laughs> oh, my. I would have been such a doubter if it was one of my friends. So shout out to my friends that stuck with me and didn't, uh, you know, nobody, nobody pulled me aside. You know, the, the classic free like, wedding. Nobody pulled me and was like, hey, man, this is not the right girl. <laughs> you know, what are you doing, bro? I didn't. None of that. Everyone's like, yeah, that's great. You guys are happy. And, and so they were supportive. So I'm very grateful for that. 
That's amazing. I know that you're quite spiritual. <clears throat> How has faith guided your intuition and decision making when it comes to business and your personal life? I mean, clearly that's been part of your intuition. Would yeah. you would you align that with the same term of spirituality? Yeah, you know, the spirituality thing, it's it's weird. Like when I think when people are like, Oh, your faith, your spirituality, it's like <laughs> I start thinking of myself in like a church in the South, like screaming my lungs out every Sunday kind of thing. And <laughs> you know, snake biting and, and whatever, you know, just crazy organized religion. And, and, you know, for me, it's, it's not that it's, 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 um, it's the belief in like energy, right. Or the belief in, um, possibilities or manifesting or the power of doing good things and positivity and kind of what that opens up in your life ahead of you. So, so you're right. Like it, it's, it's spiritual in a way, um, of that, like life force and energy. And mm -hmm. I think, kind of comes back to paying attention to that you know I there think there, mm -hmm. there's there's signs all the time you know I think about um you know I think about when I'm buzzing when I'm around somebody that's really positive or there's a really powerful experience I can you know it's like I pay attention to that like humming that's going on in me um you know and then on the flip side I pay, pay attention when I'm in you know around bad bad juju or bad experiences or people that have you know ill ill intentions it's like I'm, I'm paying attention to the twinge in my gut or you know the little hair on the back of my neck that stands up hmm. um and 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 when i think i know something you know i can cue on cue in on something the running the running joke with my team for all the years was you know dave's gonna know you know, so don't, there's no point in hiding. And it's like, <laughs> you know, I would, I would know things like crazy. And I, and I don't say this in like a weird way. No, no, like, I get it. I do the same like, thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, I would know when like people were pregnant, I would just like feel it. I'm like, oh, something's up. And I wouldn't know exactly what it was, but I knew something was up. And then like, sure enough, they're like, I'm having a baby. I'm like, yeah, I kind of knew something was going on. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, so, and, and so, you know, it's like it, just tuning into that. Like, that's what makes me a spiritual person is that I've just have so many examples of, kind of that, those moments of awareness of good, bad excitement and just listening to that and really learning to tune into that. Like, and then, and it's, you know, I don't know. I've kind of always been that way. It's a big part of what has created such a powerful result in your life, I think for sure. Um, you know, so you, you're married, you have the kids, you're climbing the ladder, the career ladder, as this is all going on. And if you were to look at all of this, how would you say having a family has changed your perspective and provided insights into all of this? I think, you know, family does a couple of things. I think family one, um, and I wouldn't say this is true for all families, but I would say it's true for, for my experience in, in, in all this is, you know, it's taught me to be less selfish for sure. Um, but on the same, you know, on the same side, it's also taught me the, the importance of taking moments to be selfish, mm -hmm. meaning like to take care of me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I, I see some of my guy friends that just like they check out on themselves. Yes. You know, they become all about the kid and all about the wife and all about the family commitments. And I'm like, where's like the golf trip that you take to just go like burn off some, you know, steam or where's, you know, where's the outlets? And so, um, but I think, but I think overall, you know, family definitely teaches you to be to be a little less selfish i mean you got to make it about someone else other than yourself but you know what i think the bigger thing is it's taught me how to be capable of more you know i used to think about um i used to think about my work ethic before i had a family and my work ethic now like they're not even recognizable to each other i can get more done and be more efficient and i can you know drive harder than when I started, even though when I think about it, I was working really, really hard. I'm just more efficient and more capable. So what do you um, mean? So you're just more efficient in prioritizing where you put your energy, delegating the rest or getting Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Because like, I don't, I don't want, like, I don't allow my work to expand mm -hmm. all day, every day, all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I have very definitive boundaries set up. Um, in my world that like work ends at a certain time and it's not that I'm not going to get my stuff done. I get my stuff done, mm -hmm. but how I get there is a lot more efficient mm -hmm. and, and it's created a more capable version of myself. 
Impressive, sir. With your endless driving grit, the Worth Group became one of the top teams at Douglas Elm, which is one of the largest brokerages. It is. And now you're on the senior management team while also leading a coaching business for top athletes. What is your biggest motivation? What's your secret sauce? And I just want to add, it's not just athletes, but what is that? What's your biggest motivation and what's your secret sauce, sir? My thing is I just want to have impact on others. Like, I know that's such a you know, beauty pageant answer, but no, like, you know, like that, that's my thing. Like I'm a builder. I want to have an impact on people. I want to create security for people. I want to create opportunities for my family, security for my family. Um, but I, you know, when I really think about what motivates me, it's really, you know, I want to make sure I'm impacting others. And then the benefit to me is that I want to use whatever, you know, whatever comes of that to find my own adventure or my own joy or, you know, my own way to spread kindness or, you know, or just like go do cool stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so I'm, I have zero motivation for titles or, you know, accolades. Like that's just does nothing for me. So, um, did you have you to know, work to get to that? Oh, for sure. Oh yeah. I so badly wanted to be number one, everything. And then I realized it was just such an empty journey. I mean, it's like you, you get to the top of Everest and you're like, Oh wait, there's Everest number two. Yes. Great. Like, here we go again. So, you know, that, that for me is, um, that's been a big shift for sure. Yeah. Why, I used why to, coaching? I, used, um, I don't know. I kind of fell into it in like a weird informal way, you know, Amanda, my wife, Amanda, she would always tell me, she's like, dude, you're people whisper. I'm like, what? <laughs> she's like, that person just told you something that they probably wouldn't tell their spouse or really anybody. And they just like laid it out to you. And, and I didn't realize that this was happening, but as I started to pay attention to it more, um, I realized I had an ability to sit with somebody and for them to not feel judged that whatever they told me was cool. Um, and that I would do what I could do to give them the best advice I could. And so it, it kind of started informally, you know, it happened with friends. It would happen. You know, I'd be walking through the office at the end of the day. I remember walking through the office one day and there's this, this gal, uh, another agent sitting in the office. And I kind of just like looked at her and I was like, Hmm, something's up. And, you know, sure enough, I sit down with her and like, we get in this conversation and I mean, talk about unloading the darkness you know, she just like unloaded this whole thing. And, and it was this moment where I realized I'm like, I can see the issues that maybe she can't see and I can give her some solutions. And, and I did and I offered and, and I didn't see her for quite a while. And then I saw her about four or five years later and she came up to me and she goes, Hey, remember that day that you told me this, this, and this? And really what I told her friend, I'm like, you need to stop being a victim, get your shit together and like, <laughs> you know, like get going. Like you're just complaining is really what the advice really was. But, you know, she came back to me. She's like, my marriage is better. My life has changed, blah, 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 blah. And I kind of had this moment. I'm like, hmm, like I didn't really intentionally do that, but it kind of worked out that way. And it was that kind of moment of like, maybe this is what I should be doing because I enjoy it. I like being able to problem solve. I like being able to really hear people's story and understand what's going on with them. Um, and I like, you know, to be able to watch people shift it. So I kind of fell into it. And then obviously having a team and, you know, running a sales team, it kind of naturally progressed that there was like more than the life coaching side, there was the business side of it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and it kind of just went from there. It's weird. It's so kinda, interesting. It was by accident, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Mm, yes and no. It's just clicking into what was inevitable, I suspect. Um, are there personal habits that you have that keep you on top of your game that you do? Personal habits. <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah. I mean, every self-help book, I mean, if you like, I've read them all, I'm actually looking at them on my desk right now. There's like one, two, three, there's like seven of them that I've read and I'm thinking about, you know, I look at all of those and it's kind of all the same stuff. Um, so I think anything I tell you would probably not be mind, mind blowing, but it's like, you know, you exercise, you meditate, you practice gratitude, you write your goals down. Um, 
I still morning do it. Routine, how, how you start your mornings, like everything, mm-hmm. you know, it, like people have made a fortune off of writing down their morning routine. Like there's the, <laughs> the miracle morning. Like a guy's made a ton of money and it's like, you go read the book and it's a great book, but I'm like, the guy's just telling you what he does to start his day. And people are like, mind blowing, you know? And it's like, <laughs> it's, you know, he's like, drink water, brush your teeth. It's like, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. But, but routines are, are huge. You know, routines are really huge. And so, and finding those habits and finding the things that serve you and the things that don't, Mm -hmm. um, that's really important. Yeah. So nothing mind blowing. Sorry. No, don't sorry. Everyone was waiting for that moment in the podcast, by the way. They're like, (laughs) okay, here, she's going to ask it, like, get my pen out. And then she's like, (laughs) then they're like, oh, wait, brush your teeth, you know, meditate. As someone someone who's worked with you, I remember you're like, listen, you got two kids that get up at the crack of ass, like 6 a.m. You're going to have to get up earlier. That's right. Yeah. I was like, yep. really? I'm not really getting that much sleep right now, Dave. That's okay. Get up earlier. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Falling asleep yeah. at uh, bath time. But yeah, I did it and I still do it. So thank you. It was a huge yeah. game changer for me. Can't do it every yeah. day as perfectly, but I do try. And if I don't, I do it in the evening. Thanks to you. Yeah. I mean, I tell people like break up with perfection. Yeah. Right. When people are like, oh, I'm not, you know. I didn't exercise every day. I'm like, who cares? How many did you exercise? Oh, I exercised four days. I'm like, great. It's progress. <laughs> I'm like, over it. Yeah, great. Yeah, whatever. But but and that's that's you know a pitfall we all fall into. We have this we have this desire to be perfect, and you know, and then one day we don't do it. All of a sudden, it's like all you know the whole thing falls apart because right. we didn't do it. One day and it's like, you gotta make sure you don't fall in that trap. I'm I'm good on that one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, a little more compassion for yourself. Yeah. Total getting there working on it what is the number one tip you give to your clients who you are coaching <laughs> oh man get your pull pen out, out pull out the pen <laughs> pull out the pen guys um <laughs> yeah no i mean this is going to be really underwhelming but it's it i think it's really important is don't complicate things and simplify things down to the fundamentals so what i mean by that is we'll use real estate sales for example um, there's, we're pitched so much stuff as like the next great thing to help us cut a corner or the purple pill that's going to make it all better. <laughs> but like, what's the fundamental of real estate? So I'm going to interview you, Fran. What's the fundamental of real estate? Like what has to happen no matter what? Get up and do it every day. <laughs> okay. And, and, and what are you doing? Connecting. Okay. That's it. That's the whole business right there. Yep. But will you make it way more challenging? We have the CRMs and we have the technology and we have the PR and we have you know, mm-hmm. mark, marketing of the listing. And it's like, yeah, that all happens. But if you chunk down what your real job is, it's to go out and connect, meet new people, connect with them, stay in touch with them, be authentic, bring value. Like that's, that's it. And you do that in every other year of life all the time. Mm-hmm. You do it with your friends, you do it with your family and you do it when you take on a new hobby, you go meet people. Like if you start playing tennis or mm-hmm. golf, it's like you're going to meet people and you stay in touch with them. Real estate's the same way. And so it's like, when I meet people, they're so twisted up in the <laughs> minutia of mm-hmm. like, you know, the other things that really aren't that important that um, it, become, it becomes a problem for them. And they just, they get too locked in on on complicating the business. And so I, I simplify it to, what's what's the fundamental of what you need to do right so people are like oh my god i just i gotta get in shape i'm like great go for a walk <laughs> they're like what that's the advice i'm like yeah go for a walk for 20 minutes every day and see what happens and then next thing you know they're at the gym mm-hmm. because now it's kind of built up to it so mm-hmm. yeah simplify and and uncomplicate things I for love sure that. i love it it's it's what you do best people just put the pen down friend they're like this dude like what is going on <laughs> not at all not at all <laughs> What would you say is your biggest achievement, Dave, or win, which is a negative term in your world, so I'm not going to go there, in your career, whatever that means, because it's so expanding, what deal has meant the most to you, those two? Um, I think I think the wins or the achievements, whatever we're going to call them, I, I think it's ongoing, mm-hmm. meaning... Mm-hmm. Um, it's ongoing like I don't, I don't know like you know what i mean like i don't i don't know if i've i don't know if i've had that like well that's it you know we've we've 
we've hit the apex like that hasn't <laughs> happened it's it's the cool part about what i get to do is i get to watch people make change constantly and and fine tune themselves and strive to be better and along that journey they're having breakthroughs and wins so it's like it's the coolest part about what i get to do i get to be a part of that all the time so i know it doesn't really answer your question but yeah it does. it's it's along the way the, i guess let's put it this way along the way i think the achievement or the win or whatever we're going to call that has been watching people have sure. their moment yeah if that makes sense 100 percent. whether that's a buyer or a seller or you know somebody that works with me or um you know one of my coaching clients it's like those have been the wins and this is, there's so many of them because they're happening around us all the time they're happening around you all the time and and i think the challenge in what we do is we tie a lot of the win or the achievement or success to a deal or a record-breaking sale or you know whatever and it's like but really there's wins all the time like i remember the one of the, my first um executive assistants she she had a bunch of credit card debt i remember this story. i remember we i remember we set up mm -hmm. this you know I, I knew it was like really messing with her and so we sat down one day and i was like what's going on she's like ah oh. she's like i've just got all this credit card debt she's a single mom um her daughter had um you know a long-term illness that that was a lot to deal with and i said well you know let's get a let's get a game plan like let's let's start paying off some of this debt and we kind of figured out this bonus structure and i remember coming in and checking in with her one day and i was like you know how's that all going and she's like oh she's like i'm down in my last credit card statement and we're talking like she's paid off a lot of debt at this point this is taking a year and a half and i remember just saying okay let's go and so we walked down to the bank and i remember paying off it was like 900 bucks it wasn't it wasn't a lot of money i remember paying off this credit card statement and it was like such a you could literally see the credit card companies like go away out of her soul and like the weight come off her shoulders and and then she went on later to buy her first house she had more kids like you know but it's like that was there was like 10 wins in that and it was like happening right there all the time but if I was focused on my deals and my like selling another house, it's like, I would have missed that. So when I think about the business, like that was the business, that was the, it was the business of people, if that makes sense. Perfectly. The business of people and the wins around you are those yep. moments, all of it. Mm -hmm. And that actually sort of is the life force kind of playing itself out, right? Without getting too, too into the weeds on that one. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just, I think you got to pay attention to like, you know there's always this like focus on success or there being this final destination to mm, success the illusion it's like it's never going to come no it's never going to come nope. you're going to be number one and then you realize that you want something more or different mm -hmm. so it's like it's getting present to what's happening to you along the way that, like like my favorite memories are like the disasters along the way <laughs> you know i remember one of my uh, business partners standing on the front lawn of this open house we'd been working every day this was like our fifth open house in in that weekend. She's bawling on the front lawn and she's like kicking the sign and she's pissed and she wants to quit, you know? And that's like, that's my one of my favorite memories. Like I laugh about it. I still laugh about it. I'm like, that was insane. Like me in my suit, sweating, her in some kind of pantsuit that she would never wear a pantsuit now. You know, she wears jeans and like a top. And it's like, but we're both like, trying to be realtors and we're both trying to be professional and she's crying i'm sweating she literally kicked a sign you know i think she might have even punt kicked a, like a muffin across the front yard that was supposed to be for the guests like it was hilarious and i'm like that's the secret sauce like <laughs> the fun stuff you know getting the award at the end of the year that you're number one broker it's like that doesn't even i mean for me it doesn't no. it wasn't even a factor yeah i know which is why it all came if you weren't in real estate, I think I know the answer to this question. What would you be doing? Um, so doing I saw this. I saw this question in our prep notes, and I think you're gonna laugh because I really thought about this. Right? I think everyone's like, "Oh, he'd be in a punk band," or like, "Oh, he'd be like, own a brewery." You know what it would be? What? Want to be one of those chefs on YouTube that <laughs> like teaches people how to cook? Random, right? Listen, there's no time like the present. I say you put your coaching hat to the side and just show me how to do buckwheat pancakes. Let's. Go. I know. I could have my daughter DJing, and then I could be like <laughs> yes. chefing and 
my wife would just be sitting there shaking her head in disappointment that <laughs> academia has failed us. So. <laughs> but no, that's what I would do. I would, I, and I, I might do it. I mean, I thought about it last do night it. and I was like, what do I do? I'm like, wait, I could do that now. I'm like, I don't. You don't I have mean, to wait. Do I don't it. have to wait. I just need to like set up a little setup in my kitchen and just start teaching people how to cook. I think you did it in so. COVID. Didn't you do like a fast forward video from above on a making bowl? cookies? Yeah. yeah. I was like, damn, yeah. that looked really pro. I was like, I'm in, I'm in. How does he do that? I'm going to, I'm going to send you that cookie recipe. It's it is amazing. mind blowing. Okay. I got it from somebody else and it's like, Game it's on. the best. There's so much butter in there though. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. But is my middle yeah. word. I love it. Um, yeah. <clears throat> when you're not working, what are some of the things you do to unwind and stay sane? I think I know, but for our viewers, let's hear it. Um, I am, um, I am a, I'm a man that knows a little about a lot of things. So I <laughs> like variety. So I love cooking. Um, I love like making sushi. Like we live in San Diego. So, I mean, San Diego's like a big tuna town, you know, I so know. I think it's one of the biggest, biggest ones in the world. So we're, we're doing sushi a lot. Um, I play tennis with a group of guys in a league. I golf, I play guitar, I sing go to the beach beach is a good one whenever I'm real twisted up I go to the beach yeah. yeah there's something something special at the beach um I travel I, I plan trips with my guy friends to get away you know we try to do adventure stuff so you know we get out we just did a trip to like a three or four day trip to Catalina on this like two engine boat that once we were out there I'm like oh oh I'm like I don't know if this was a good idea like, <laughs> probably I should have updated my power of attorney before I left because you know but we went and lobster dived and snorkeling wow. and fishing you know stayed in this god-awful zombie apocalypse camp and you know again it's like I look back I'm like that was awesome so yeah I don't know I, I try to get a I try to try to get things that either challenge me something I have to learn or something that I can go build connection with people. So it's a lot of things though. I mean, the list, the list is long. Hmm. Okay. And what's your biggest advice? I would say my biggest advice would be a really cold IPA from a San Diego brewery <laughs> and a fish taco. That sounds amazing. <laughs> no. Yeah. I have to say, um, I haven't even been able to say much on this podcast because everything that you're saying resonates quite uh, deeply for me because I think that's why I worked with you the way I did um, because your philosophies and your underpinnings of how things move and work is part of what shapes and keeps your gravity and gravitas with people um, thank you I know you have a busy schedule so I just want to say thank you so much for taking time out of it to be here today and to talk yeah to thanks friends super fun I know I talk a lot. It's that impatience thing. I start talking, I'm like, get all excited, and you know, so you don't your poor listeners are like, we want to hear more Fran. So. No, not at all, actually. And I think this was amazing. So thank you. You're amazing. Yeah, thank you, Fran. You're welcome.